Okay. Hello, everybody. I'm uh, I'm Miles Anderson. I'm a PhD student in this uh, this uh, uh, this research group, LPQM. Uh, I've been a PhD student for about three years, and I specialize in uh, microresonator frequency comb generation, and but also uh, supercontinuum generation, uh, which I'll be talking about. Uh, supercontinuum generation, but really. Uh, mostly simulating supercontinuum generation. <coughs> now, uh, okay, so uh, part, part one, I'm just going to have an intro, intro to supercontinuum generation, uh, talk a bit about uh, nonlinear optics and the nonlinear Schrodinger equation, uh, a bit about the generalized nonlinear Schrodinger equation, which is the real deal for supercontinuum generation, uh, numerical methods. Then in part two, then we'll actually do some simulations where I'll talk about solitons, dispersive waves, and soliton fission, Raman scattering, uh, and everything else to do with uh, uh, the most well-known uh, aspects of supercontinuum generation. Uh, so I got the impression yesterday that some of you are completely new to the idea of supercontinuum generation. Uh, Who's new to the supercontinuum generation? Cool. All right. So then, uh, I'll try to stop every now and again. And uh, if you guys have any questions while I'm presenting, you can ask. <coughs> OK, part one. OK, so uh, supercontinuum generation is uh, its actually quite a, a fluffy definition. Uh, it used to be called sort of white light generation for obvious reasons. It just means dramatic spectral broadening uh, of some, some light source through a nonlinear medium. So, uh, and this, this could be governed by a variety of nonlinear processes. Uh, and it can, be, it can be coherent or incoherent in terms of uh, uh, laser light. Uh, so uh, this, is, uh, this is one of the first uh, published examples of supercontinuum generation with an impulse, sorry, an input pulse spectrum going through a highly nonlinear fiber turning into this enormous spectrum through a variety of processes uh, forming, although this was a different experiment up in the top right, forming, let's say, that this white light spot which then put through a diffraction grating gives a nice rainbow, but, uh, and as you could tell by the fringes, this was proved to be co coherent at the time. So this sort of, uh, uh, this was a really important discovery of a a method to generate coherent white light in the lab. <clears throat> um, so, well, what, what are, so what are they for? Supercontinuum? Uh, okay, so frequency combs. Who's heard of frequency combs? <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Um, okay, so if you import a, if you import a narrow band frequency comb and you can broaden it, you can broaden it. Uh, I'll switch it later. You can broaden it uh, uh, coherently. You can retain your frequency comb lines across an enormous spectrum, forming, let's say, a, a, a frequency, uh, frequency ladder, as they say, an equidistant frequency ladder or frequency ruler, which you could use for all sorts of uh, highly calibrated, highly precise spectroscopy, metrology, uh, uh, time, time transfer, or, or just passing coherent information from one spectral region to another spectral region far away. Um, also, if you want, you can actually create powerful incoherent supercontinuum sources, which could be very useful for uh, optical coherence techno optical coherence tomography, uh, uh, where, which is very important for biological imaging. Um, Hmm. Oh, and also, uh, it can, uh, if, if it doesn't have to be very broad, it can be, it can be a vast array of lines for, let's say, uh, wavelength division multiplexing, if uh, the lines are very well se separated. And, um, mm, yeah, ah, I know, the most famous example of, uh, of supercontinuum generation for frequency combs was uh, broadening a, an input pulse to be an octave in span so that uh, there is one frequency on one part and then the double frequency on the other part. This, this meant that the, the lower frequency could be doubled and then referenced to the other side of the comb. And this would basically, this would basically tell you 
that therefore the, the offset between those two values would tell you the overall absolute offset frequency of the entire frequency comb, which normally would be drifting back and forth and you would never be able to tell what that is. But as soon as you could self-reference it, you could, ex you could measure exactly what that is based on your RF electronics. And that means that the frequency ladder is now uh, fully uh, measurable with RF electronics and therefore is practically uh, absolutely precise in terms of uh, measuring uh, atomic transitions and stuff like that. Well, not absolutely precise, but no longer, no longer optically imprecise, RF precise. And that was a very famous example that won the Nobel Prize. Um, <coughs> so such nonlinear platforms for supercontinuum generation have been uh, first just, uh, just optical fiber, which has been manipulated to become highly nonlinear, basically maybe with, uh, let's say, tapered, tapered fiber or fiber where the core has been engineered uh, to focus light more intensely so that the nonlinearity is uh, enhanced. Uh, then more, much more famously was microstructure or photonic crystal fiber, uh, such as the example on the right. Uh, where uh, a system of air holes engineered a uh, what's called a photonic band gap, which was able to engineer the core size to be even smaller, even more focused, and more, most importantly, it shifted the dispersion window, the anomalous dispersion window, which we were talking about yesterday, more towards the, uh, from the infrared, more towards the visible spectrum, more towards, let's say, 800 nanometers which at the time was when we had super powerful titanium sapphire pulse lasers. So titanium sapphire lasers at 800 nanometers combined with these photonic crystal fibers uh, gave, uh, gave this result, basically. Uh, nowadays, uh, we're, we're interested in a photonic waveguide-based supercontinuum because uh, these uh, more uh, highly dense uh, ceramic or semiconductor waveguides can focus light even more intensely, have a higher material nonlinearity, and uh, well, they're chip integrated, and being chip integrated is just great for future applications and integration and everything like that. Uh, there is one such example on the bottom. Okay, so the main the main nonlinear optics governing supercontinuum generation, which I'll really it's really going to be all about today is the, going to be the, the chi three nonlinearity. Uh, this is the actually uh, this is just the if I might just quickly just draw oh, here's a chalk. But uh, but if you if you're if you're uh, if your regular sort of uh, let's say if the, your regular energy potential of of the of the say the polarization state of the atoms in the medium is in a regular parabola. Um, you know, you get your linear polariz polarizability where you just get a harmonic uh, relationship, but of course a real atom is, uh, is more, becomes more shallow basically at higher stimulations. And so you get this, uh, you get this sort of, uh, let's say, you get this. Uh, you get this kind of quartic correction to the potential well, which stimulates uh, uh, higher order harmonics uh, for with a with a very powerful incoming uh, electromagnetic wave. Um, and this, uh, well, when you translate that to force, that that translates to a, a a cubic term. Basically, what I have on the slide right now, where we have some kind of polariza polarizability, which depends on the uh, the uh, triple product of the electric field. Um, so, uh, let's say if you were to have two traveling waves inside a, such a nonlinear medium, you would get uh, uh, several terms. So, you would get, if, well, if you were to calculate the polarization wave, you would get, uh, uh, so you get like, E1, E1 at omega 1 and E2, E2 at omega 2, these are the self-phase modulation terms where basically the, the, the waves changed, changed their own phase by themselves. Then you get, say, let's say uh, 2 E1, E2, omega 1 and 2 E2, E1, omega 2. These are when the two waves influence each other's phase as they travel. 
And then you get uh, E1, E1, E2 star at uh, the difference, the, the difference frequencies, the triple, the triple sum of the frequencies in, in, in difference configurations. So uh, 2 omega 1 minus omega 2 and 2 omega 2 minus omega 1. This is what, let's say, generates uh, new frequencies. Um, <coughs> did I? Yeah. Um, yeah, that's what I was just saying, cross-phase modulation and four-wave mixing. Yes, so that's the last term is called, uh, known as four-wave mixing because it, let's say you mix three waves and you get a fourth or you mix two waves and get two more. Uh, that, could be, that could be degenerate or non-degenerate. So you can have, you could input three, you could input three waves and get a fourth and this is exact or you could get, you could input one wave and then two more waves can be stimulated, uh, let's say, spontaneously out of the noise background, which I'll describe later. That's known as modulation instability. That, that gives rise to a more incoherent uh, light generation process. Um, there's an example of cell phase modulation of a pulse. Basically, the pulse just keeps modulating its own phase as it travels, and so therefore it has a broadened spectrum. And uh, on the right there, you can see uh, with pure nonlinearity, the pulse profile might not change, but the instantaneous frequency in purple there uh, begins to arise. This is the cell phase modulation in just the, this mo its most basic form. Uh, th this would be an example of, uh, let's say, four-wave mixing. If you put, put those two waves in, you will get these sidebands spaced around it, uh, spaced by the difference frequency between those two waves. Um, so uh, cross-phase modulation and four-wave mixing are things that are usually understood by, obviously, as I've said, having inputs which you regard as being separate. You have you know, one input and two inputs or three inputs. Uh, throughout this lesson, I think, and throughout usual super continuum generation, you consider having a single input, a single envelope equation for your input waveform. So, uh, so we won't... I won't really be often talking about cross-phase and four-wave mixing that much in this lesson, but that, that is how they could be considered. And then you have, uh, um, now uh, this, this, this equation up here is uh, the three-eighths term. This is uh, all of the difference frequency terms. But of course, you could go omega-1 plus omega-2 plus omega-3, and you get your sum frequency products, your triple frequency products for uh, chi-3 processes. Uh, or third harmonic generation, as it's known as. Uh, and we'll also neglect that, because that usually hardly ever happens. And it's usually weak. But uh, it's very, it's, it's exciting if it does happen. Um, and then there is, uh, the, there is an imaginary component to uh, chi-3, a, a, let's say a dissipative component, uh, that's known as Raman scattering, which I will discuss later. Okay, so... <coughs> Um, oh, yeah, so uh, I skipped over the chi-2 nonlinearity. This is uh, um, uh, looking at my, the potential graph I drew earlier. If you have a non-centrosymmetric molecule that, let's say, has a, a cubic correction to this potential well where the electron movement is biased towards one side, you get a strong chi-2 nonlinearity, which is a polarizability that is based on, well, the square of the electric field, the double product. This is... This creates simple nonlinear processes, like just say second harmonic generation, where the frequency is doubled. Or you put in two frequencies and they add together. And then the reverse of that, uh, parametric down conversion uh, or difference frequency generation, where you go in the other direction. Uh, and also two photon absorption. Um, so those are usually understood in terms of I, I, I'm having an input and then I'm coupling this input to the second harmonic output or the half harmonic output. So that's something that could be understood more in, let's say, coupled mode equations and, uh, well, it's not usually, it's not usually related to powerful supercontinuum generation. However, um, uh, there have been experimental examples where um, uh, supercontinuum generation has been performed and then an existing chi-2 nonlinearity in the material has then also stimulated second harmonic generation and difference frequency generation on the supercontinuum generation. So 
you could think of the chi-3 process happening and then maybe the chi-2 process uh, affecting things a bit or uh, adding to it. But uh, that's, that's more, that's the state of the field right now and uh, we don't have to go through it uh, today. Yes? Yeah, double the wavelength. Yeah, if you go half, if you go half the frequency. Yeah. Oh, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. Like well, like in this in this example down here, they uh, uh, this is this is a few slices of of supercontinuum generation that they did through lithium niobate, which is a a chi two and a chi three material. So, oh, sorry, sorry, no. This one was uh, this one over here was lithium niobate on the right. This one on the left was uh, aluminium nitride, uh, but. Uh, the one on the left, they create the supercontinuum, but then they also detected signatures of difference frequency generation over way at uh, between 4,000 and 5,000 nanometers, which was the difference between the pump part of the supercontinuum and the dispersive wave part of the supercontinuum. They basically interfered with each other and through a chi-3 process, sorry, through a chi-2 process, created a difference frequency signal and also a second harmonic signal. So you can mix everything together. But that's the most complicated situation uh, we would uh, think of lately. <coughs> so basically, I'm just saying we're going to ignore Chi 2 from now on. Oh, yeah, and the top right was a, a photograph from my, my own supercontinuum experiment where I noticed that there was a lot of second harmonic generation going on. Sorry, sorry, no way, hang on. No, oh, that actually, no, that was third harmonic generation. Now I just remembered. But either way, it's the principle of the thing. <coughs> so, um, uh, this will just be the, the, the derivation slide, but uh, the derivation of the not of ah, now I'll talk about the nonlinear Schrodinger, Schrodinger, non Schrodinger equation. Uh, the derivation of which can, is uh, uh, I won't get into really, but I'll just I'll just summarize it. If we if we start with the uh, sort of Maxwell or Helmholtz wave equation with uh, a diffracting traveling wave with a, a kind of a, a polarization source, a, a linear polarization and a nonlinear polarization. Um, uh, we make a number of assumptions. So, of course, we're going to assume that we just have one spatial mode in our waveguide that's at a single polarization. You can do coupled modes if you want, but let's assume there's just one. Uh, so, we're going to consider Kerr nonlinearity only, which means all of those self phase difference frequency components I was talking about in the chi 3 expansion. So, no third harmonic. Uh, separable transverse mode profile. So, in a waveguide, this is usually true. Well, in a, in a, it's, it's mostly true. Obviously, in, in reality, the the transverse and the longitudinal modes are kind of coupled. They're not entirely separable, but we, could, uh, we can pretend that they are entirely separable. Uh, also, we could, we could consider the nonlinearity to, let's say, be small, even though it's, we, we talk about a big nonlinearity, but it's not that big. It's not, uh, this is, let's say, uh, we're not uh, pumping a material at its uh, resonance transmission, for example. Uh, far from resonance. <coughs> and of course, uh, a slowly varying envelope approximation, which maybe, maybe some of you might have heard of, where we just neglect the second derivative of the, of, the, uh, of the envelope, the change in the envelope amplitude. Uh, this, is al this also assumes that uh, there is no forwards-backwards interaction in the wave as well, and uh, um, Yes, we're not treating uh, negative frequencies. So, uh, if you do all that, and I recommend, I will recommend some textbook later which does it, but you will find at the end uh, this, this equation called the nonlinear Schrodinger equation because it's similar to the Schrodinger equation with a nonlinear component. So, this, this shows the development of the field envelope based on dispersion and Kerr nonlinearity. <coughs> and I'll explain that. So, uh, yesterday you, you learned a lot about dispersion. You may have learned a lot about dispersion, but I'll, I'll briefly recap. So, uh, so <coughs> if we have the propagation constant, the phase propagation constant, we call that beta. 
which is n omega over c, and that depends on frequency. Uh, it's it's uh, very uh, intuitive to uh, put it to a, a, a Taylor series expansion so we can get out the individual components and what they're really responsible for of this, uh, this, this propagation constant. Uh, so the, the zeroth order beta zero is just the, let's say, the phase constant, or, or maybe it's related to the phase velocity. Uh, if we're talking about an envelope equation, then it could be completely ignored, of course, but it's useful for uh, you know, interferometers and stuff. <coughs> then the first order, uh, beta 1, is the slope correction to beta 0. This tells us how different wave vectors at different wave numbers travel as a group. So that's why we call it the group delay. Uh, 1, over beta, 1 over beta 1 is actually the group velocity. Uh, so, and in our modeling of supercontinuum generation, in our modeling of pulse propagation, uh, we could just follow the pulse as it travels. We don't need to consider the group velocity either. So, if we just follow the pulse as it travels at its center of mass, as it were, we could do this uh, transformation I just put on the right there from overall time to fast time. So, from little t to capital T. This fast time is the time frame where we follow the pulse at its group velocity. So that allows us to get rid of the first two terms of this uh, expansion of the wave vector, so, well, the wave vector or propagation constant. Okay, so then, then, then we have really proper dispersion. So beta 2 group velocity dispersion. So that's, that's the way that uh, different frequencies will travel at different group velocities. And so therefore, this causes pulses to spread or contract. <coughs> and basically, this constant is the main contributor to pulse duration as, as, as a value in, in supercontinuum. Uh, then the higher orders, beta 3 plus, uh, they are basically, they, they serve to disturb and distort. And also provide phase matching or resonant, phase ma uh, resonant far off resonance to other spectral regions, let's say, as I will go into later. Uh, and uh, these orders of dispersion are f uh, can be found using the finite element, finite element methods uh, we used yesterday in, in a waveguide you're interested in. <coughs> so here was an experimental example we did in our group. Uh, the uh, getting rid of those first two terms gives us, let's say, like an integrated uh, phase constant which is the same as that integrated dispersion constant that we were talking so much about yesterday. Well, it's not the same. It's proportional to it because this d int is in the resonator context, but the beta int is in just a, a single pass waveguide uh, context. And uh, so if you got rid of, rid of beta 0 and beta 1, you might get a green line like this at the bottom, which uh, is a, a quartic because we've got beta 1, 2, 3, 4. Um, and uh, that allows us to have, let's say, phase matching between uh, the middle and these spectral wings, which I'll get into. <coughs> uh, the nonlinearity component uh, is, uh, well, that's based on the nonlinear material index, N2, which uh, can be found experimentally in various materials. And uh, obviously, the effective nonlinear, <coughs> excuse me, the effective nonlinear area of the waveguide uh, which can vary over broad op optical range, but uh, we usually like to pretend that it's also constant, although it definitely becomes very large at mid-IR frequencies and, and stuff like that. Um, and uh, that was also given in yesterday's FEM tutorial on how to calculate that. So, so with our FEM tutorials, now we can calculate the dispersion and nonlinearity of our waveguide, and we can then put that into our very uh, canonical, our, our OG uh, nonlinear Schrodinger equation. <coughs> uh, let me shut this door. <coughs> um, I would like to uh, re express the nonlinear Schrodinger equation more in terms of a a more mathematical, more mathematical dimensionless way because this is very useful to understanding 
what's going to happen. <coughs> uh, so we, we can express it in terms of uh, lengths. So uh, the nonlinear Schrodinger equation, it, it's, it describes an envelope variation along the z axis. <coughs> so that's why we could express it in terms of lengths. We could have the, uh, if we change the time variable to be proportional to the pulse duration, and then uh, we factor that in, uh, we could have this dispersion length, which is the length it takes for dispersion to become dominant. And similarly, if we replace the uh, amplitude variable, if we make it proportional to the peak power of your pulse, and uh, uh, we add in this constant, we find this is the nonlinear length, <coughs> the length that is required for nonlinear effects to become significant. So I'm mean, sure, as you can imagine, uh, significant broadening, significant nonlinear effects will only happen if the dispersion length is way larger than the nonlinear length. So you would want a really short nonlinear length for significant supercontinuum generation to happen. Does that make sense? Okay. Good. Okay. <coughs> well, if that makes sense, then I'll talk about modeling that equation. So, uh, Uh, the, the just most mind-numbingly simple way to model that equation is just to, now the thing is, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's not, there's not an analytical solution to the equation, so, but there is an analytical solution to the individual linear step and nonlinear step of the equation. So we can just pretend that we're going through a waveguide where it goes dispersion, Nonlinearity, and then dispersion, then nonlinearity, and dispersion, then nonlinearity. And uh, if we do that small enough, it basically makes the same result as in reality. <coughs> so we simply, so we recast the nonlinear Schrodinger equation to that one on the right there, L plus n a. Now L and n are not commutative, but we act like they are commutative. So, um, <coughs> and of course, both. L A and N A individually are solvable analytically. Just uh, so we could just do what I did on the bottom there, on the bottom right, uh, to solve that differential equation analytically, pretending that they are separable. So exponential to the step size H times the operator L, and then the same with the operator N, and then the A, a field. Um, so this is this is really easy. It's very simple. I, I highly recommend it for any beginners to nonlinear optics of pulse propagation. Uh, yeah, very highly recommend it. Uh, yeah, so you have to uh, set your step size manually. It has to be very small for obvious reasons. Uh, if things get very complicated in your model, the accuracy requirements of your s small step size precision can blow up. So we'll talk about what to do then. Uh, I use it for simple, say if, if you have a pulse and you want to see if it broadens a bit in some waveguide, you could, this is, this is extremely fast and, and reliable. Uh, however, uh, uh, as you can imagine, what we are simulating here really is literally a waveguide that has all dispersion and then all nonlinearity and then all dispersion, then all nonlinearity. So uh, if, if your frequency window is high enough, this can cause, uh, numerical four-wave mixing to occur, where you're actually modeling some uh, spatial instability caused by this switching on and on and on, of, on and off and on and off of uh, nonlinear dispersion. Uh, so that can happen as well. So that's why you need to have a very small step size. <coughs> so uh, how does that look like? So, okay, so the linear step. Now, now here I've actually included the higher orders of dispersion, beta 3 and beta, beta 4, for your Yes. Um, I'm just curious. When you say small, are you talking about the average over the length of one wave between the dispersion and the linear area? Um, ah, uh, okay. Uh, I'll show you later, but a good rule is that the, the step size should be uh, like, it should be, I usually say the step size is about 1% uh, of the nonlinear length. Okay. That's how I said it. Yeah, because, uh, yeah, yeah, so this is why I did introduce the normalized equation, because this is, 
this, this describes how the equation performs in a mathematically pure sense. So in order for your step size to be uh, relatively accurate, it has to be a very small fraction of one of these lengths, basically. Yeah. Usually the nonlinear length, obviously, if we're doing supercontinuum generation. Uh, okay, so the uh, linear step in the time domain has all these derivatives, uh, but uh, uh, by just taking the Fourier transform of that operator, uh, derivative turns into a factor of uh, i omega. So this just becomes this. So in the frequency domain, this just becomes a, a polynomial operator, uh, and that's very easy. <coughs> Uh, and the nonlinear step, now that, that's, that's based on the time intensity of the pulse. So we have to do that in the time domain, which is simply that. Uh, so computing the manual split step method basically involves going F of T, I F of T, F of T, I F of T. Do you know, you know what I mean? F fast Fourier transform. Fast Fourier transform. Back and forth and back and forth. Okay. Uh, here is a... Here is the extremely basic algorithm of that, basically. So as you can see, so we take in field A, uh, linear operator L, uh, nonlinear coefficient, and step length. So there's our nonlinear operator, right? And then over here on the right, uh, we've got, let's say, the input A t times by our nonlinear operator solution. Then that goes into the frequency domain to be times by our linear operator solution, and then back into the time domain. And then you do that over and over again. And this is the fastest possible way, basically, to model uh, propagation. Uh, well, well it's the, it's, numerically, this is the shortest step you could basically take. Uh, yeah. <coughs> um, so. Uh, I think after this section, then I'll open up the actual MATLAB files and we'll, we'll take a tour. But now I'm going to say, okay, so that was the real easy part. Uh, but real supercontinuum generation has, is actually uh, extremely rich and has other components. But if, uh, if you're not able to follow all of this, then that's, uh, that's okay. Uh, so obviously there's loss. So this makes the system non-conservative and dissipative, and that, uh, that changes some things. Uh, and then we have, uh, as I mentioned before, stimulated Raman scattering. And then we have a thing called Kerr shock, or self-steepening. Uh, so this is basically now, and you, you know, remember in the slide before I had the triple product of uh, EEE? Well, reali well, realistically, it's actually more like the chi-3 of the E, and then the convolution in time of a, of a uh, non-trivial, non-linear response function uh, r with the uh, e squared field. Uh, one such, uh, uh, before I said gamma is uh, basically equal to this, but you notice here I might have used omega naught, but really it's just any omega, so therefore it is dependent on frequency, for example. Yes? So is this one inside the integral? Is that how quickly the nonlinearity responds to the change in the uh, that's, oh, that would be contained within R. The T1, the T1 here is just the, is the, the variable of this integration. A, a T1 has to be, uh, T1 has to be up until T in order for this to be a causal, causal response. Yeah. You know, yeah, yeah, it's, it's just, yeah. Oh, um, uh, you don't have to, but basically <laughs> it just means, it just means, uh, it just means that, uh, uh, there is a, uh, there is a kind of a delayed response to stimulation in the nonlinear medium. Uh, that, and that response function is contained in this, this operator. But, uh, yeah. Yes, yes, that's right. Yes, that's right. Yeah. <coughs> yep, yeah, yeah. We were saying, before we were just saying a, a completely uh, instant trivial response, but now we're having a non-trivial response. And this leads to a modulation of like your wave response by the head of the clock. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's, that's a good way of describing it, yeah. Um, so 
the fact that the kernel linearity varies with frequency itself actually means that we can introduce a kind of a linear correction to the kernel linearity itself. This, I'll describe it later, but it basically it, uh, it's the group velocity ch shift in terms of intensity rather than just the phase shift in terms of intensity. But uh, it's, uh, it's usually small. Uh, and then we have the rest of the uh, nonlinear response to integrates, which we can separate into. Okay, no, if you don't follow this, it's fine. But, but I'm basically just saying here is the instantaneous nonlinear response. That's why it's a delta function. And here is a delayed nonlinear response, which is uh, given by HR of T, which is the Raman response. Uh, the Raman response itself. Here's an example of which that they model for glass. It's basically a, a sinusoidal modulation and a exponential decay of that modulation. So it basically means the medium is hit by a pulse and then it oscillates and decays uh, as a response to the intensity of the pulse. So that's why it's nonlinear. Uh, yeah. uh, if you if you take that Raman response and put it in the frequency domain, you can see that, let's say, from, from, the zero, from your zero frequency, this is a, a kind of a gain um, and uh, a gain at an offset frequency and a loss at the opposite offset frequency. So this basically exchanges energy from one side of your spectrum to the other side of your spectrum. <coughs> uh, and uh, you can, well, this is how you put it into your nonlinear step, but I'll, I'll show that next. So therefore, with all those, we get the generalized nonlinear Schrodinger equation. And uh, you don't have to understand it, but that's, that's where it is if you would like to look at it. Yes? Can we repeat what the Raman uh, I will discuss that in the next section. But okay. yes, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, but it, uh, for now, it's a, it's a kind of a delayed uh, Kerr nonlinearity. It's not the instant Kerr nonlinearity. It's like an echo of the Kerr nonlinearity. And it happens to favor one, some frequencies and disfavor other frequencies. Uh, uh, is it self yeah, self phase modulation. Yeah. It's, a, it's all in that term gamma. And the Kerr nonlinearity is the term in the equation that is gamma a squared a, basically. The cubic. Uh, Nonlinearity. So, so there's gamma, and uh, uh, there's a squared there, and then there's a at the back. Uh, this is the Raman part, and this is the slope part, and you could kind of take those out if you want. What, what, what data? Which one? Um, a is the a is just the amplitude of the field, yeah, and uh, uh, cubic just means it's a squared a. A cube. Yeah, uh, it's in here and here. <coughs> um, so that, that equation is, uh, you could technically, now before I talked about the split step where you go just uh, linear, nonlinear, linear, nonlinear, and you could do that with a generalized NLSE, but uh, it's a massive pain. So uh, a better thing to do would be to use, uh, let's say, a, a, a ODE solver in your, in your uh, Python or MATLAB which can just, you basically just put in the equation and then it iterates to find the solution for you. Uh, this makes things easier for you. Uh, because, for example, you don't have to uh, select the step size anymore because this can get tricky and controversial when you're trying to reach a low uh, error tolerance. Um, yeah, it's just better to handle uh, all of that. Uh, uh, but one problem with that, and, 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 and okay, this is, re this is really niche, so you could ignore me if you like, but uh, the, the L part of the equation is considered stiff. Uh, so sometimes we can, uh, to make things extra fast, we could do this change of variables, uh, which uh, if you've ever done quantum physics, uh, I mean, I have it really, but uh, if you have, you might have heard of something called the interaction picture, um, which is just where we... We changed our field envelope A to this A prime, which is already automatically solved with the linear solution at every opportunity. And then, then we solve the nonlinear equation, just the nonlinear equation. 
using OD45 or RK45, etc. This is called the interaction picture, and it just it uh, uh, it's it's something you want to think about if you wanted to advance precise supercontinuum generation. If you don't understand it right now, that's fine. I didn't understand it, um, but that's that's what we do. Uh, that that enables you to basically solve the nonlinear Schrodinger equation in the fastest possible way. That's what I'm saying. Uh, according to these graphs, which say that, uh, where the, the 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 method I just described is the black line, and the the simplified split step I described before that is the uh, it is the gray line here, the reduced split step. So, as these graphs say, you can if you're doing something very precise, you can save a lot of computational steps by doing everything uh, really split step adaptive and interaction picture and everything like that. <coughs> uh, that that method looks like this. So, if you don't follow this, that's okay. Uh, but I'll just explain. Basically, we take in the distance uh, distance array. Uh, let's say our our spectrum AW, our input spectrum that we're going to iterate on. Uh, this is just uh, fast time resolution. It's just for this calculation. Our our linear operator. Uh, this, is, uh, this is the normalized uh, optical frequency, which we need. Uh, gamma, as I've described. Uh, the, the Raman proportional fraction. This is how much Raman is in your nonlinearity. And the actual Raman response itself in the frequency domain. Uh, so as I said before, there's a bit, a bit of this change of variables where it solves the linear part automatically. Uh, we take that to the time domain. Then we find out time intensity of the pulse. And then uh, uh, skip all this, just go here. This is the Kerr nonlinearity operator, where A squared A. Then put back in the uh, frequency domain, where it is then timed by the normalized frequency to give us the Kerr shock, Kerr slope, the slope uh, uh, correction. Uh, and then. Uh, put back into the real units domain with uh, the reverse change of variables with the, non -linear, with the linear operator again. Now, that's, it's kind of weird, but that's just how it is. And this goes very fast. Oh, and if there is Raman, this is the next term. If there is Raman, then we times the Raman response with the power spectrum of the pulse, and then put that back into the time domain, and then just add it to the regular Kerr nonlinearity according to the Raman fraction. So if you don't get it now, that's OK. Uh, basically, this is just how I'm describing it to you. And then uh, if you're interested, you can continue to uh, uh, think about it. Um, so uh, let's actually have a look at the stuff I've been talking about. <coughs> OK. Let me just change something. <clears throat> Actually, no, I'll, I'll, I'll take you through this. Um, I guess, so I guess to follow along, uh, could you probably open if you can? But if you can't, that's OK. You could just watch. Uh, uh, SCG split step uh, silicon nitride demo solothon. <coughs> uh, a lot of this is taken from this textbook. Which is given at the top of the of the of the script. So uh, this is the this is the setup script where we make all of our parameters for what we want to simulate. Uh, so this is the this is the number of points uh, in like our yeah basically just the number of points that are going to be operated on. Uh, this is our time width in picoseconds. So five picoseconds. Uh, here is the speed of light, yeah, and uh, this is our wavelength, 1550 nanometers. So this is described here. Uh, so that's our center frequency. Uh, here's our fast time grid, so it's capital T, as I said, the fast time variable in picoseconds of our time window. Uh, here is some noise, 
This, uh, if you don't understand this part, that's fine, but uh, we, we need to add some noise, low-level noise in the background in order for noise-based processes to be stimulated so that we could have a, an accurate uh, simulation. Uh, so this is responsible to, uh, this is, this is uh, proportional to uh, Planck's constant and uh, the repetition rate of our pulse laser and our frequency window. So basically it's, uh, it's, uh, it's shot noise. Well, quantum noise. <coughs> so uh, then, okay, waveguide parameters. So uh, here we have arrays of our betas, starting from beta 2. So uh, here we just have beta 2, minus 0 0.132 uh, picoseconds squared per meter. Uh, now I could just keep adding higher orders of beta 3, 4, 5, 6 to this array. And that will give us all of our dispersion coefficients. Uh, this is the, the uh, nonlinear index of the material. So this, this will go into the Kerr nonlinearity. Uh, the effective mode area, so 1.3 uh, square micrometers of, the, of your waveguide. Uh, that's a silicon nitride waveguide that I found in Comsol. Uh, oh, yeah, I also found this in Comsol, this value. This value is from the textbook and stuff. <coughs> okay, so then with those values we have gamma, and uh, uh, we could also put our loss factor in an uh, uh, exponential coefficient in per meter, uh, and we're going to just not have loss right now. Okay, so now now I'm. This is about our pulse input, so. Here I have a pulse duration of uh, 0 0.15 picoseconds, 150 femtoseconds. This factor is because uh, it's, a, it's a Sech squared pulse. You know, the, the Sech function is a, is a pulse uh, function. It's, it's not Gaussian, it's Sech. And that's, that factor is uh, for that to be the case so that it, it will be a 150 femtosecond pulse. Uh, this is me calculating the uh, dispersion length, you know, for, for my benefit, because I want to know what the dispersion length is. And uh, uh, just ignore that for now. That's just uh, the, the dispersion length again. Uh, and in this, this simulation, uh, actually, let's say, no, I'll put it in three. Um, I'll explain this later, but this is, uh, this is just, this is a factor of amplitude, because uh, I'm going to have a, uh, I'm going to talk about solitons later, but this uh, uh, soliton is the type of pulse, and I'm just going to put three solitons on top of each other. Uh, basically, it's the, pulse it's the pulse amplitude, but I'll explain this uh, in a second. Uh, and this is me calculating the nonlinear length uh, based on that, but you could also calculate it based on the way I showed you earlier. Um, so. So this is the power of the pulse, and uh, if I want to know the pulse energy, this is also the formula for that. Uh, then this is the actual pulse envelope. So power set function T over T0. Uh, this stands for waveguide length. And I've made the waveguide length, I've made the waveguide length uh, roughly equal to the uh, dispersion length for reasons which will become clear when I run it. So, so if you don't know what I'm doing right now, you'll see what I'm doing later. Yes, yeah, it is. Yeah, it's automatic. Yeah, it's a, it's one of the trigonometric functions. So, like cosine, sine, tangent, such. Yeah. Okay. Uh, here I set here I set my here I've set my step size for the split step method h, and uh, my nonlinear length was here. It's I've related it to the dispersion length, but just trust me for now. But anyway, either way, I've made it the nonlinear length divided by 50. Uh, this is the amount of steps I need based on the length of the waveguide and the nonlinear length. And uh, here are the actual coordinates of those distances that I've just worked out based on the length and the number of steps, obviously. Uh, this is. Uh, the Raman response stuff, which uh, I'm, is not important for this example right here. 
That's why I've set the actual Raman fraction to zero. But uh, this is the Raman uh, response I was mentioning earlier with those time constants, uh, which is set for uh, glass. Uh, so if you wanted to add in Raman, you could set that to this value, 0 0.2 or 0 0.18, but uh, we're going to leave that at zero. <coughs> then, uh, oh yeah, this is just some final transformation. So here's my initial, here's my initial amplitude. Uh, this is me evaluating that beta, uh, beta 2 omega squared, beta 3 omega cubed, beta 4 omega fourth polynomial for the linear operator. That's, that's what this is. That's why it's on, on factorial uh, i plus 1. Uh, then I add the dispersion term to the last term, and that gives us our overall linear operator. Uh, this is just to shift it correctly for the function. Uh, and I'm going to store all of the, uh, all of the amplitudes in this uh, matrix. And then, then here's where it actually runs. This is the propagation here, where I repeatedly uh, do prop step two over and over again. C equals prop step C with uh, those uh, with C, um, the linear operator, gamma, and the step size with that function I showed you before. Actually, it is, I think it's probably here. Here it is. Just that, the split step. Uh, where was I? This one. Uh, yep, and I'll just store the amplitude. Uh, and this is all. This is all plotting. So uh, that could be up to you. So if I just press play, psh, it's really fast. Uh, okay. And we got this pretty spectrum. Uh, I will explain this later, but this is what is known as a higher order soliton. <laughs> Basically, it just shows the pulse broadening, modulating, broadening, compressing again, broadening, modulating, compressing. It, it goes through this interesting cycle. Uh, but I'll, I'll get into this uh, later. But uh, this is just me showing that the uh, this is just me showing that it works. Um, yeah. The if I were to open, let's say, um, uh, SCG Dudley. It's called Dudley because this is all based on this textbook by one John Dudley, who is the master of supercontinuum generation. Um, he wrote a great textbook, lots of very good papers about simulating supercontinuum generation. In fact, uh, his his algorithm and all of this is actually available online for free. Actually, maybe I can find it. Oh, no, I'll, I'll, I'll link it to you later. <coughs> uh, but this one, this one, I have the same, I have the, ex it's the exact same sort of setup function, except now, uh, wait, uh, that's my soliton number. Um, this does the same thing, except it calls this uh, GNLC function, which is uh, that really intense interaction picture uh, OD45 uh, algorithm. So if you, run, if you were to run this one, I hope it works. It takes a bit longer than the split step, but well, it gives the same answer. And uh, this, if I take a look at that GNLSC function, this is the thing that is written by uh, John Dudley, and it is basically it does a lot of setup of the time grids. Of the of the normalized frequency in order to calculate that curse nonlinearity slope, uh, it calculates the uh, linear step as I was saying before. Oh yeah, this is the normalized frequency. This is some Raman term and the, uh, just shifting things so it's proper. And the um, let's say the the distance coordinates and uh, here are all the uh, OD forty five options. So it sets a we want to have a target accuracy of ten to the minus five. Uh, 
then we call, we call OD45, given all of our parameters I was sort of going through earlier, all of our necessary parameters. And then that feeds into this. RHS here stands for right-hand side. Basically, just means the, the everything on the right of del A, del Z, the, the partial differential equation. This is everything I explained earlier in the slide. Um, and everything else is just, uh, just processing the output. This is also to do with the, that change of variables I was talking about earlier. If you don't understand that now, that's fine. <laughs> yeah. But that all, that all goes into uh, running this simulation. Um, if I go back to that SCG Dudley, uh, it was called uh, SIN Demo Soliton. <laughs> Um, for example, if I go, uh, and I'll explain this earlier, I'll explain this later, but if I go um, n equals 4, uh, fourth order soliton, okay, it creates this extremely rich uh, modulation, oh, sorry, extremely rich development of phase modulation of a fourth order soliton. But if I were to do the same in the split step version, SCG split step, if I were to do the same, there are some problems. Okay, see, blech. Something so yeah, it didn't uh, for a fourth order soliton. It's uh, it's not maintaining its shape anymore, and but it's supposed to because it's a soliton. So the split step algorithm has has shown its uh, its uh, inability to maintain the truth. Uh, basically, symmetry is beginning, beginning to be broken. Hmm? Uh, let's find out. Let's find out. Let's set uh, h to be a uh, nonlinear length of a 200. Okay. Just a second. Uh, I, don't, I don't need to plot so many rows, but... Uh, okay, I think it got a little bit better. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, I'll uh, also show you what happens if you don't take enough steps at all. Wait, it's, uh, my computer's going a bit slow. Okay, I shouldn't have plotted that uh, figure. Ah, here we go. You there? Good, 20. Okay. No, wait. Ah, here we go. Okay, so uh, now uh, here the step size is so big that when it goes linear, nonlinear, linear, nonlinear, uh, there's some actual spatial instability which is being stimulated in the waveguide now, creating these uh, sidebands. Uh, in fact, if you really did build a waveguide that was literally linear, nonlinear, linear, nonlinear, you actually would get this. But uh, this is a this is a simulation, so this is this is an artifact. So so that's the consequences of having a wrong step size. Okay. So uh, uh, how much time do I have left? All right. Okay. Okay. Then I better now go through the real stuff. Okay. So I'll skip the I'll skip the intermission. Okay. Okay. Yes, Anat. Oh, oh, right. Uh, you know. Okay. Well, you know the change of variables I was hinting at. That interaction picture. I made a I made a GNLSC non-IP to demonstrate that if you actually take out that change of variables and instead put in the linear part of the differential equation as is, okay. and you run it, it takes like five times longer, basically, yeah. Uh, this is something that I've recently learned, that this is t because the linear step, if you include it in the OD45 as is, it becomes stiff, where basically the pulse is continuously dispersing, and then the, the algorithm has to resolve that by taking a really small step the whole time to constrain the solution, so it has to take ages to do it. But if you just automatically solve the linear step in the variable, it just ignores it and it goes really fast. 
uh, yeah. Okay. So. <coughs> oh yeah. So uh, in all of these examples, when I've marked SCG Dudley silicon nitride demo, I'm using silicon nitride parameters that you might find using FEM simulations of silicon nitride. But of course, if you do them with photonic crystal fiber or highly nonlinear fiber or silicon waveguides or lithium niobate waveguides, you'll get other parameters. Uh, and so those are, those are parameters for loss, dispersion, nonlinearity, and Raman. And I put Raman as a question mark because in some materials you, you could just ignore Raman. Like in, in silicon nitride, mostly, you can actually mostly ignore Raman. <coughs> but we, sh we should not ignore Raman in this tutorial. Uh, and then the other important parameters, uh, as, I've, as I've gone through in the little tour, um, uh, we have pulse duration, pulse peak power, or energy. Um, and you could have a Gaussian pulse, or you could have a strangely shaped pulse. Uh, but the thing is about uh, Sech pulses, it's, as, as I would describe, uh, a Sech pulse, or soliton, is literally the solution to the nonlinear Schrodinger equation. So it acts as a building block for the nonlinear Schrodinger equation. It acts as a good reference for the nonlinear Schrodinger equation as uh, what you're putting in. Like if you're putting in a pulse, you're thinking, uh, how many solitons is that worth? Is it worth half a soliton? Is it worth four solitons? Oh, I'll, 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 I'll get there. Um, OK, solitons. <laughs> yeah, now I'm realizing. Uh, now I'm realizing I did a lot of um, uh, non-linear narrative in this uh, in this <laughs> this tutorial, as it were. You know, you know, like that movie Memento. Um, <laughs> now it all comes together. Solitons. Okay, so so that non-linear Schrodinger equation I showed you before with just beta two and gamma, just those two. Okay, the solution to that equation. Oh yeah, I said it's not. It's not. I said before that it's not analytically solvable, but actually it is, just in that case. Uh, it has a pulse solution that does not, it has a pulse solution where, uh, remember that pulse I showed you that in the uh, spectrum domain was constantly broadening with cell phase modulation? Uh, yeah, uh, well, what if uh, instead of that happening, the dispersion then reversed that broadening, basically? or or, or uh, similarly, what if you had a pulse that normally would disperse because the blue and the red would then separate and broaden out, but then the cell phase modulation would then push it back together again? Uh, if you, the pulse that does exactly that is this solution. So, such, uh, oh shoot, okay, that should be a capital T, sorry. Uh, such, this is fast time, so it should be a capital, a capital T, I apologize. So, uh, such T over T0. Um, square root of p naught, and if these, if p naught and t zero follow this relationship, it's a soliton, basically, uh, where n is this soliton number I've been hinting at this whole time. So if you just set n to one, where uh, p naught is uh, beta two over gamma uh, t zero squared, you have a soliton. A pulse, it's a set shape pulse where the nonlinearity and dispersion completely counteract uh, and it does not spread. Ah, okay, hang on. I have to uh, clarify one extremely important thing. Uh, something I completely forgot, but actually it's, it's completely important. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, Okay, well, I could just point it to it here. Okay, in order for, in order for the dispersion and nonlinearity to cancel each other out, the, the sine of beta 2 has to be negative. This is known as anomalous dispersion, when uh, blue frequencies travel faster than red frequencies, and then the Kerr nonlinearity stops that from happening. If beta 2 was a positive value, in fact, there's no soliton solution. So you'll find in many of the examples given, uh, beta 2 is negative. I, I believe yesterday in the, uh, in the simulation uh, of dispersion, 
we often talked about anomalous dispersion and we need anomalous dispersion in order for everything to match up in order, in order for us to get phase matching for soliton formation, basically. Yes. Uh, so when uh, when uh, 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 beta two is the um, beta two is the way it describes that different frequencies have different group velocities. If beta two is positive, that means that uh, a, a red pulse will travel faster than a blue pulse. Uh, as a whole pulse, this will cause the red part of the pulse to go forward and the blue part of the pulse to go backwards and the pulse will spread. Um, if, if beta 2 is a negative value, it's the blue part of the pulse which will go forward and the red part that will go backwards. Yes. Yeah, well, absolutely it happens. Well, well, you, well we, you, if you send a pulse through a, a prism, you know, and you get the rainbow, that's the same reason. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, pulses always spread yeah, in yeah, any no, medium. No, yeah. But I, I guess the question is, when would you have a negative sign or when would you have a positive oh, sign? Oh, oh, right. Yeah, um, well, I'll, I'll tell you. Uh, it's because, okay, so yeah, so normally, uh, normally through gr uh, bulk glass, usually uh, the red frequencies just travel faster than the blue ones, like, like the prism. But uh, because, of, uh, because now we're concentrating the mode in a highly confined waveguide, uh, we're changing that. Uh, he, inside is the refractive index of silica nitride, and outside is the refractive index of silica. Uh, at, at, at high frequencies, the mode is tightly concentrated in the refractive index of silicon nitride, and then at low frequencies in the infrared, it blows up to travel more in the silicon dioxide. And that, and that turning point between the refractive indices of silicon nitride and silicon dioxide causes this, uh, causes the dispersion curvature to flip sign, and it could give you anomalous dispersion, basically. That's why waveguides are the best, basically. Yeah, it's because you can, you, can, you can engineer anomalous dispersion with them. <coughs> okay. Solitons. So, uh, uh, if you if you like to have MATLAB at the ready, uh, oh no no I'll do it. Um, well you can, but uh, okay yeah what was I saying right? So yeah this is the solution for so anomalous dispersion. If beta two if the sign of beta two is negative, you could get these soliton solutions. If it's not, you don't. You just it's just all flat and spreading and transient. So if you would like, you could open that. Oh wait sorry ignore that line. I'm supposed to delete that. It's the one at the bottom. Uh, if you want to try that, it's SCG Dudley SIN underscore Soliton. Uh, and in it, uh, everything is prepared for you. Everything is, uh, the distance of the waveguide is prepared so that it contains the periods of oscillation. Uh, all you have to change is that value n that I was changing before earlier. That'll determine the order of your soliton because solitons can be placed on top of each other, basically. And when they're placed on top of each other, they, uh, they go through this uh, strange uh, uh, pattern of, uh, how would you call it? Well, they go through a repeating pattern of, uh, of uh, self-interference and then recombination. Um, <coughs> Yeah. So I know. Uh, oh no. Wait. No. I don't. I don't have to do that because I already have it in the. I already have it in the slides. Uh, if 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 you did it, in that file. If you set n equals one, you get, an unchanging spectrum. Uh, also, uh, these are the other parameters to to be set in such a such a, 
uh, in, in the script, that setup uh, folder of a beta 2 of minus 0 0.13 picosecond squared per meter, uh, pulse duration of 180 femtoseconds, n equals 1, uh, gamma of 0 0.74 per watt per meter, this is a pretty high nonlinearity, uh, um, peak power of 17.2 watts. Well, this, this is set by having n equals 1, actually. I should, I should put an arrow uh, uh, that these two are saying the same thing. Uh, oh, this is also saying the same thing. Uh, if you were to go n equals 2, now, now P0 is 69 watts, and now we have this interference pattern of two solitons uh, interfering with each other. And if we set n equals 4, then we get that interesting uh, four periodic interference uh, thing. Um, uh, now one cool thing you will notice is that this is why basically the first part of that where we have a narrow spectrum, right? And then we have a broad spectrum. That's, that's basically our key super continuum generation moment, which I'll show you in the next examples. Okay, so now I, I'd like to talk about uh, dispersive waves. So this is what you definitely have in real super continuum generation. You have a non-parabolic dispersion profile where you have beta 3 and beta 4, etc. So you don't have the blue dispersion operator anymore. Now you have the red one or the purple one. Um, so this means, as uh, I, I believe uh, we were talking about just last night, this, this, believes, this, this, this means that uh, a traveling wave here is phase matched to a traveling wave here or here, as in, as in the wave fronts are traveling together. That means they can couple efficiently. They're not walking off each other. In terms of four-wave mixing, one could couple to the other, you know, 100%, basically. Um, <coughs> so in the red case, this is weak third-order dispersion. So basically, the pulse inside the dome here is just going to be slightly perturbed. But in the purple case, that's strong third-order dispersion. And a pulse inside this window is going to be basically um, uh, wrecked, as uh, we shall find in these two demos. SCG Dudley SIN demo DW emission. This is in the red case. And SCG Dudley SIN demo fission, which is the purple case. Uh, what do I mean by those? So in that one that says uh, DW emission, uh, this phase matching condition occurs ages away. So the phase matching is only in the wings of the spectrum. So basically, when that, if we launch a third order soliton, the third order soliton uh, expands in terms of that, that, that pattern it makes. It, it goes through an expansion. And then it excites four wave mixing at this phase matching location. And uh, a dispersive wave is formed in the resulting spectrum. In the time domain, this corresponds to this, this, this short pulse that is just ejected from the main pulse. Uh, but after that, the soliton largely carries on as usual. You know, it's only slightly affected. Uh, in the purple dispersion case, we've said beta 3 now equals uh, uh, 10 to this value. Um, now the, 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 the phase matching condition is so close in the middle of the spectrum. Now basically it is, it's broken the symmetry of that third order soliton pattern. So when the soliton spectrum expands, it's suddenly uh, rendered in twain. One of the, one of the, one of the sub pulses acquires a shift in its center frequency and is itself actually ejected from the main pulse body, leaving another sub soliton behind. So, so we, basically I'm saying we started with an n equals 3 soliton, and now afterwards we will end up with actually three individual solitons. So this is called soliton fission. Uh, that's, why, that's why we have our n equals 3, because, because basically I'm saying what we've launched contains three solitons, and if they are fissioned, they will split into approximately three, or maybe two and a half solitons. I think here, here it looks like there's two solitons and then lots of waste energy. 
in terms of this extremely powerful dispersive wave here. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Which one? Oh, right. Uh, this, uh, oh, shoot. I think this was from, this is a, this is the, the, jo the John Dudley script plots it with delay, and I forgot to change it. Um, uh, that also means faster time. You remember when I was saying faster time? I meant the co-moving the co-moving uh, time frame. Uh, that's also known as, let's say, delay. It's like if you're, if you're doing an autocorrelation with a pulse laser, you have, your, you, have your delay, you have your delay of so many femtoseconds. It's just a really short time scale. This is a delay. Yeah. It's also known as fast time. Yes? So I guess that would in the case of this plot to me, that if you propagate it for 30 millimeters, that yep. this Yes. Yeah. You will have to delay your pulse by this. Yeah, like uh, 250 femtoseconds. And add correlation again. Yes. So then it's the correlation between your original pulse and your generated. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's, yeah. This still means that now we have, uh, now our fast time is wrong, kind of, yeah? Yeah. Uh, because, yeah. Because the spectrum yeah. is now it's shifted. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I guess that's true. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, because uh, so so this is the co-moving frame based on beta one, but beta one should have a beta three correction to it basically because of this. Yeah. So the, so this this event has caused a change in the group velocity basically for this part of the pulse. Uh, uh, well, this, this soliton is uh, vaguely launched in the opposite direction, I guess, by, by conservation of, uh, via, via conservation of energy. Uh, high frequencies have to be balanced by low frequencies, you know, photon-photon-wise. So that's why the dispersive wave at high frequencies has shifted the soliton to lower frequencies. So that's why uh, this is why this has happened. Uh, with, with Raman and other terms, uh, this no longer applies anymore. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but uh, but the, here it applies. Um, obviously, this could be this, the, the whole thing could be flipped by just flipping the sign of beta three. It just becomes the opposite, you know, for low frequencies and high frequencies. If you just flip the sign of beta three, the cubic faces the other way. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Although, uh, depending on your waveguide platform, uh, that might not be an option. You know, you might be stuck with your dispersion profile. Okay. So, uh, a note. As I've been saying, there's uh, initially a higher order, higher order soliton goes through this pattern of change. Um, but because of these perturbations, usually when it, when it goes through its maximum phase, you know, something terrible happens. Well, no, 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 something great happens, actually, and you get your supercontinuum. But obviously, after that point, then that, then, that, then that pattern has stopped now because it's been ruined, but that's fine. Uh, so this is, this is the main event for supercontinuum generation. You basically have your input pulse and then this point of first compression. Uh, and by compression, I mean in the time domain. Uh, this is log, but basically it goes, uh, here's the broad pulse, and then it becomes a super narrow peak here when the pulse goes like that, like a wave, like on the beach or something. All right, okay, so now, now about, about, about Raman scattering. Sorry, what time is it? What time is it really? 10.30. 10 10.30, oh, right, okay. Uh, then I'll be brief. Um, so uh, Raman scattering is basically, it's kind of like beta 3 except in the Kerr term. It's, non, it's an asymmetrical nonlinear gain process, as I was saying, where... Uh, uh, high intensity frequencies are boosted in terms of low intensity frequencies. Oh, wait, sorry, the opposite of that. Uh, this is an approximation we use, but in glass it's a bit more spiky, the response. Uh, this base, uh, in photon terms, this corresponds to a high energy photon being exchanged for a low energy, pho low energy photon and a phonon. 
in the material. So basically, a, uh, the, the intensity modulation of your pulse has, has started ringing the molecular bonds of your glass. And this has uh, sh redshifted your spectrum. Uh, this strongly contributes to the soliton fission, even more so, as I'll show. Uh, and uh, this is really important in SAO2 glass. Uh, in silicon nitride, it's not that important. In some, in some crystalline materials, this gain is really narrow, so it's very, very specific. In fact, you could have Raman lasing if it's very narrow, if it's very pure. Uh, for solitons, this actually, uh, so it does two things. So in this case, we have our, it's called soliton fission. You could open this in the Raman example. Here we've turned Raman, here we've turned the Raman fraction on. But now, okay, soliton fission has occurred before due to this Raman scattering. But also, not only that, but because of the Raman scattering, because of this gain curve, the soliton frequency has in fact, is now continuously shifting towards longer and longer wavelengths as it continuously loses energy to these molecular bonds in the material. Um, and hence, is actually just getting slower and slower in terms of, in, in terms of its group velocity in the medium. Um, this is actually a handy technique you can use for shifting your pulse spectrum from one wavelength to another wavelength, actually. You could just go, I want to move my pulse from this wavelength to this wavelength. You could put it through a, a, a certain fiber where you've designed it carefully, and it could, ra it could just ram and shift as far as you, would lo as far as you want. Yeah. Well, while retaining its soliton uh, shape, because it's a soliton. Uh, finally, this is, this is niche, but this is, this is the effect of that curse slope I've been hinting at. It's really subtle, but it basically just means that the top of the pulse is going to start leaning because of its intensity. And this could cause a catastrophe at some point when this becomes infinitely steep. But usually then, at that point, higher order dispersion then intervenes and then stops it. Uh, so that, uh, that, there's a couple of examples of that code, but basically, Self phase modulation occurs as normal with, with very low dispersion, and then suddenly this kind of extra shock wave might happen here. And you'll get sudden broadening on one side of your spectrum. This could be, if you could pull that off in supercontinuum generation, that's pretty good because it get, gives you a really nice flat outburst in the spectrum. Here, here is normal dispersion actually. I've turned off the soliton effect. So this is just broadening, and then there's a shock wave. Uh, I think I don't quite have time to go into coherence, uh, but if I just show you this example, incoherent. This is what happens when you set the soliton number to, let's say, 30, and the pulse duration here is now 570 femtoseconds. It's kind of long in terms of pulses. All the previous pulses were about 100 femtoseconds or so, 150, 150 femtoseconds. This one's going to be 570. Uh, with n equals 30 for the really high peak power. Uh, what's happened now is the, the soliton fission has occurred, right? It's, it's fissioning into like 30 solitons or, or so, you know, lots of solitons. So many solitons, uh, you know, minor differences, minor noises on the input, input pulse can give rise to differences shot to shot of the, of the exact form this is going to take, you know. You'll do this once, and you'll get, you'll get something complicated. You, would, you do it again, you get something slightly different. And you do it again, you get something slightly different. And this, is, uh, this, uh, this hurts the re repeatability of the supercontinuum you're generating. Uh, basically, basically, basically makes it kind of incoherent. Uh, and also, if you look at the spectrum, it, it looks horrible. Yeah. Um, uh, also a note. Basically, what, what's going on here, now, I, I, I guess I don't quite have time to uh, really get into this, but so self phase modulation is occurring on the pulse, but then uh, the pulse amplitude is so massive that uh, a thing called degenerate four wave mixing occurs, also known as modulation instability. This is when uh, quantum noise begins to be amplified side to side of the spectrum, um, causing new spectral features to be born out of noise, and of course, noise is random, shot to shot. So that, the, that fact has also contributed to this spectrum being a bad spectrum in terms of coherence, in terms of repeatability. If this was a frequency comb, the, the lines 
the frequency comb lines will be really broad and maybe not even visible anymore, basically, because they just don't have that phase predictability anymore because of these, this random soliton pattern, because of the quantum noise uh, causing new frequencies to be born. Uh, that, uh, that slide I, I, I showed earlier shows you a certain formula you could use. If you simulate a supercontinuum over and over and over again, you could, go, you could take the shot-to-shot -shot coherence. So you compare one supercontinuum you made to the next one, and you normalize it, and you get your uh, coherence value. And then you do that 100 times, 200 times, and you could get your coherence spectrum. And this is, uh, this is something you could do to measure how, how good your supercontinuum is in terms of coherence. <coughs> Um, but here's a, here's a good example. If you go to SEG Dudley, SIN demo full, this uh, gives something where, let's say, the, the soliton number is, as I calculated, it's 5.4, 51 femtoseconds, uh, with all of these beta values, which I got from Comsol. If you put in all of those in that order, you get this sharp, higher order polynomial with phase matching conditions. You get your soliton fission, dispersive waves, and uh, we've got transfer of our spectrum from 1550 to 1000 uh, and 3500 nanometers. And, it's, all, and it's, uh, it's coherent and it's good. And so this is a good example of, of a good supercontinuum where we've uh, transferred energy from here to here. Uh, good. So that, does anybody have any questions about supercontinuum generation that I've discussed? <clears throat> yes. Oh, uh, yeah. You have to look it up. Okay. <laughs> yeah. You know the uh, yeah. Uh, well, people do experiments where they'll ha they'll put in two waveforms and they'll measure the four wave mixing and then therefore they'll measure what N two is in a material like gallium phosphide or something. But it's something you have to, you have to look up online, basically, what N2 is. Yeah. Uh, no, I think you have, to, you have to have a knowledge of the, uh, of the, um, uh, there's, the, there's the, well, there's the, is the Kramer's Kronig kind of stuff that I think may, give you hints at how, how it's going to be, but I think you have to measure it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's, it's, it's a separate kind of scientific investigation, finding the end to kind of, yeah. yeah. Yes? Um, in the MATLAB prediction, you had this noise count. Yes. How did you get that again? Uh, um, that noise term, I believe, I think it corresponds to having one photon in every mode of the simulation. Uh, and by mode, I mean, uh, so for example, that, that simulation had 2 to the power of 10 points. Yeah, yeah. yeah, 2 to the power of 10 individual frequencies, as it were. Yeah, 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 yeah. So if you imagine having one photon in every one of those frequencies. Right, okay. Yeah, yeah. And each of them had a random phase. Okay, okay. That's your most basic noise that you could expect to have. You could add other noise you want. For example, uh, you can make it so that uh, every shot, every individual shot of your pulse might have a slightly different phase, or a slightly different position, or a slightly different amplitude. This could also feed into your noise analysis if you are uh, doing noise analysis. Okay, but yeah. it all relates back to the frequency group that you used. Yes, it does. Yeah. yeah. Well, that, well, okay, well, that noise was, let's say, if we have one photon per frequency in our window, basically. Yeah. Yeah. You could add more noise if you want. Yeah. Uh, any more questions? Any at all? That's it. Okay. Well, uh, so for the exercise, I, I, uh, I think I, it would be really nice, I think, if you could just f familiarize yourself with all of those processes. If you just read over the algorithm, uh, familiarize yourself with that setup script, you know, what if I put in this power? How is this power calculated? What if I put in this pulse? Just, you could just try, try different things, basically, to see if different things happen. So. Take whatever time you would like to do to do that. And then um, uh, the next uh, exercise is, uh, OK, uh, from exercises yesterday, actually import the values we found from your FEM simulations. Import them, 
do any simulation from the FEM simulations yesterday, import the beta values, and uh, uh, do supercontinuum with these pulse parameters, and just uh, show, show me what you, what you obtained. And I'll be like, that's good. Probably. And then, um, and then there are these questions. Yes. Then there's, there's, more, there's more exercises, but I think uh, you could read them in the uh, board. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. 